Welcome back to another episode of the My Latin Life podcast. Since 2014, My Latin Life has been your trusted guide to traveling and living in Latin America. Today, I'm joined by a buddy named Stephen Story. He's a Twitter personality. He's got a YouTube channel, uh, digital nomad, does a lot of internet stuff, and he's a big Brazil guy. So any Brazil fans out there are, I think, are going to get a lot of value and enjoyment out of this episode. Steven, how's it going, man? It's going good, man. It's, I'm glad to be here, bro. Absolutely. I think we should just uh, quickly apologize if the audio is not perfect, perfect on your end. Uh, you're making do uh, in, <laughs> in the car, but uh, but I think we'll make up for it because I, I think this is going to be a sick podcast and I think you're going to have some, uh, some cool uh, experiences to share with us. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop my car here in like two minutes, so the audio should get better anyway. <laughs> no worries, man. No worries. Y- you know, um, when when I uh, first started going hard on Twitter uh, about six months ago, you're one of the first names that came up. You were really well connected with everyone. Uh, it seemed like everyone was following you. You have like almost 50,000 followers on, on Twitter. Uh, you've been doing the internet business thing for a while, living in Latin America. How, how long you been um, doing the digital nomad thing? Bro, so like, I was moving all, I've been moving around all around the United States for work, um, since 2016, 2017. So it's been what five years now, almost six years of mm-hmm. just being a nomad proper and then switching to this straight up internet stuff has been since, um, I would say when I started moving out of the country for work was in 2018. So I moved to Canada and then after that, I figured out how to, I, I, you, you know, you got to figure out how to live out of the United States, you know, or live out of your home country. I think that's the first trick to this whole thing. Uh, but in 2009, 2019 is when I figured it all out. That's when I came to Brazil. Started, I started truly making money online while living in Brazil. And um, the rest was history, bro. That's awesome. Are you a uh, Canadian? I am American, but I was living in Canada. Okay. Yeah, I know you got the like southern accent. What, do you do you tell people what what state you're from? Yeah, man. Yeah, I'm from Alabama. I'm from Tuscaloosa, Alabama. I'm from the deep south. Shit, made it out. Yeah, man, I made it out. Thank God. And you know, it, it's kind of funny that you're back uh, in Alabama right now. You told me you're going to Brazil in a couple of days. What's yeah. it like to be back in Alabama? Must be kind of uh, a lot of mixed emotions. Yeah, man, it's surreal. You know, like, Alabama is the first place I had to make it out of. Like, so I taught myself because I actually like Alabama. I I enjoy being from here, and I lived here until I was 26. So, like, um, I had to teach myself to hate this place so it would make (laughs) me faster. But deep down, you love it. Oh, hell yeah. Hell yeah. I love Alabama. You know, so I want to be back, and it's like after years of being like, all right, I don't want to be here anymore. I got to leave. I got to leave. I got to move to come back here. And then I was helping my family with some things for a couple months. But, um, yeah, I mean, it was, it was mixed emotions for sure, bro. Just like – and then, and then like, you get accustomed to a different lifestyle in South America. And you don't have that lifestyle. So it's like you got to kind of manage your emotions for a bit. When you come back, you mean? Yeah, when I come back, yeah. yeah. Right, right, right. Probably, uh, you know, there's no beach, less partying, <laughs> maybe mm-hmm. – uh, uh, don't want to give away too much too early, but yeah, definitely kind yeah. of a, a lifestyle downgrade and you're just kind of helping the fam and yeah. maybe focusing less on yourself and more just yes. on, um, keep, yes, keeping, man. keeping things afloat for everyone. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, because I mean, obviously guys, we, everybody has responsibilities. Um, some of those responsibilities will happen to you in South America, by the way, if any of y'all decide to live in, uh, live in South America, life doesn't stop because we go to another place, right? Um, and so I found that, um, you know, you just got to make those sacrifices and be a little uncomfortable for a little bit. But that part is, is over for now for me. So uh, we'll, we'll get into that as, as the, the call progresses, you know. It's much different, man. Like, I find that, I find for me, the quality of life downgrade, man, is like almost frustrating, like, I'm like yo, we, some gotta be, some gotta change, man. Like, why we got no beaches over here? Like, why don't we have coconut water? Like, where's the the fish at? You know what I'm saying? Like, but you know, 
you deal with it. And the, the, the thing, I mean, there, there's, there's, there's so many topics to that, like a digital nomad that goes home. There's actually so much around that. Um, it might not be relatable for some people that haven't got their journey started. But for me, it's like we know we've leveled up. We've like learned new skills. We've learned yeah. languages. We've got our yeah. money up. We've had all these cool experiences. But when you go home, people don't really know that except for what you put out there. And so you're just kind of walking around or you're, you're seeing the old people and you're like, yo, I'm in, in your head. You're like, yo, I'm super leveled up. But they just kind of see you as like the, the same kid from the neighborhood. Yeah, man. And then like, they'll, you know, they'll ask you something like, so where you been at lately? Or like, so where do you live at now? And I'm like, well, I live in Brazil. What? You live where? <laughs> And it's like his whole like because you'll you'll find yourself telling people you live somewhere else because I'm like well you asked the question I'm about to tell you now right they're about they they think you're about to say Atlanta or something yeah yeah like I live down the street so I'm like no I don't you know like I live far away but so it's it's uh and then like let's so let's talk about this real quick so like I think one of the advantages when you come home is getting certain documents taken care of and certain paperwork taken mm-hmm. care of mm-hmm. like. Like, for example, I renewed a visa. I got a new visa while I was here in the States. Um, I was able to get my birth certificate and some other things taken care of that I needed for Brazil, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's like sometimes we're on this, on the journey of like fully, fully getting out of your home country. Uh, You do need to come home to handle documents, to do taxes, uh, handle certain business meetings, certain things you just cannot do in South America. Yep. Open some bank accounts. Yeah. Yeah, I do all that, you know, and it's like it was, it's like a little list of things that pile up, you know. I know what you mean. I feel like uh, the past couple of years I've spent more time just logistically going around collecting documents. To your point also, man, you got to be so much more responsible for yourself as a nomad than you would as just a person just living outside, just living in your own country, you know. Yeah. In what in what way? In what ways did you have to become more responsible? Well, let's talk about language, right? So, whenever you're in your home country, right? For those of you all who are listening, you are a person who is, you know, 18, 19, 20, 30, 40, whatever age you are, level English speaker, French speaker, you know, whatever language you speak is your first as your first language. Mm-hmm. When you go to a your second country, your third country, and you're picking up a second language, you now speak at like a two-year-old level, a three-year-old level. You don't speak as a college-educated person anymore. You don't speak as a person who has, like, our pedigree is in our accent. It's in our uh, our speech and our words. You lose all of your pedigree when you are learning a new language. Mm-hmm. And so these are all crutches that we use in society that, that show other people where we're from, who we are, what we know. All right? And so... It kind of like, it takes like, it makes making connections much harder, I think. Have you noticed that? Yeah, well, it's definitely a blank slate. I think, uh, especially in Brazil, they're super welcoming, especially to a gringo. um, Yeah. Especially to one that, you know, kind of looks like them. You know, you're you're like a black guy, I guess. So you kind of blend in and stuff. And they're, they they obviously probably like find that really cool. Um, But yeah, you you do kind of get the chance to reinvent yourself. Yeah, yeah, it's a, and you know, it's fun, right? Like, it's fun to reinvent yourself, man. Like, for example, in English, I can be quite opinionated. In Portuguese, because I don't, I don't have the, the language <laughs> around arguments and opinions, I just agree with every, I, I agree with everybody. You know, that's funny. I agree with all their political stances, everything. I don't care. I'm just like, well, shit, I, 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 I can't disagree with you, and I don't, I don't feel like trying to find a way to disagree with you in this conversation. So you just, I become a lot more amicable. I think it, that's part of it. And I think also just people down there are so much more amicable that it kind of rubs off and they're just so like anti-confrontation relative yeah. to the U S. Yeah. I agree. I think. Um, yeah. Sorry, say, go ahead. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so like, well, I think also like North Americans and Europeans, we can be quite confrontational politically speaking and about our opinions. We can be quite confrontational. Yeah, I, I just know like every like girl I've met in Latin America is just so friggin' agreeable and so easy to be around. Man, yes, we can talk about that. We can talk about that if you want to talk about that. 
Cause, we, um, let's come, let's come back to it. Let's come back yeah. to it. Um, cause yeah. what I want to do real quick is just dedicate like five minutes to talk about how you make money online, just to okay. give people like a little bit more context to what you do, because, uh, you do actually have like a public persona. I mean, you have yeah. like 50,000, uh, Twitter followers. You have a uh, thousand plus on YouTube, a couple different yeah. platforms. You got a bunch on Instagram, like 15,000 yeah. or something on Instagram. Yeah. I noticed C Cobra Tate, Andrew Tate follows you on Instagram. How'd that happen? Yes, he does. He follows me on all my social media. Have you guys met up? No, nah, man. I, I'll tell you that story, man. So like Tate brothers, when they were first coming out years ago, I was following them and interacting with them and doing what they were saying to do back then about international travel. Right. Mm -hmm. So like when I moved to Canada, Tate was like, get a Canadian bank account, get a Canadian credit card. Okay. I got it. And then I knew I was going to Brazil right after that. And so like he was, his whole thought process was get on as many grids as possible. Instead yeah. of getting off the grid, just get on as many grids as possible. And so, you know, I was like, I guess he would say I was an early supporter. And then like, I was just doing cool shit too. So like, I wasn't doing, I wasn't doing like they were doing it, but I always interacted with them. Um, and they would, you know, give me advice in the DMs, all that stuff, bro. So like, you know, it just, That's pretty cool. it wasn't like that, man. Did you join the war? I didn't, I did not. I actually should. Uh, somebody pulled me to the side and was like, Steve, you should join the war room. I was like, all right, I'll, I'll think about it. Cause I was just, I've been building out my own product. So I was like, let me just focus on building this out. And before I start getting in other groups, you know, but so um, it sounds like you're a pretty good online networker and, and you've done a good job of just kind of like keeping tabs with people, I guess, kind of exchanging DMS. Like you said, has that been a, a priority for you? Yeah. I mean, I mean, like, you know, like, bro, you get what you give, you get what you put out. Right. I always try to support people that's doing something I think is positive or is going to help other people before everybody else does it. And I, I make sure to keep the lines open. I check on people. Hey, what's up, man? How you doing? Hey, you know, I see you doing this now. Hey, you, you know, just, just literally being a, like a good person on it, on the internet. And so instead of consuming what everybody's putting out, I also want to interact with them. And I find that by doing that is by being a genuine person online I can develop friendships the same way I would if I was in real life. Yeah. You know? And so do you think that um, like Andrew Tate gets value at all from, from what you do um, and people that aren't, and I guess more broadly, people that aren't maybe interested in the insurance adjusting industry. We'll, we'll touch yeah, on that. They, you know, like, like, do people, do people get value from what you do, even if they're not interested in your niche, but just maybe the way you present yourself, things like that. Yeah, man. You know, so like, Insurance adjusting is what I do for a living. That's what I teach other people so they can find freedom, right? Whether it's you know in, in the United States or you know wherever they are. But that's just a that's just my way out, right? That's my way out of struggle. Okay. Other than that, that's just that's just a small portion. Everything else is like my philosophy about life and like what I think about you know the day to day things, you know. So because I've been. Like I've, had, I've had a Twitter account since 2009, and I've been, like, talking on it since 2009. I hadn't been, like, a, you know, an account to screw around on. Like, I've been actively cultivating that following for a long time. Oh, wow. Yeah. And then, so when did you – we'll come back to that. I kind of want to yeah. know a little bit more of the story. but And then, so uh, if you don't mind, just talking a little bit about insurance adjusting just for a second, just so we can kind of get yeah. it out of the way. Um, so is it, is it, I, cause it's funny, I've been exposed to, you know, remote work and digital nomads for a long time, like years and years and years. And I had never really heard of this independent adjuster thing, insurance adjuster, um, on basically until I joined Twitter and I saw that there was you and there was a couple other guys and I was like, huh, like there's a million ways to make money online. Yeah. So is that, I know there are people, some people do it in person and they visit, mm -hmm you know, the houses and the cars or whatever. And some right. people do it like fully online. How, how does that work fully remote? I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to do a brief overview. Okay. Yeah. So what, what is independent adjusting? Independent adjusting is an industry that's been around for almost, well, it's been over, over 90 years now, close to a hundred years. And basically in the United States and Canada, when, um, 
insurance carriers like Allstate or State Farm or Progressive or whatever, whenever they get overwhelmed with insurance claims, they have a certain amount of time they have to handle those claims before they get they get fined by um, the Department of Insurance, right? And Makes so sense. what they'll do is when they get these time crunches, they'll hire people who are, uh, people who are also uh, licensed as adjusters, which, which mm-hmm. are called independent adjusters. When those staff adjusters are, are overwhelmed, they come in and say, hey, we need 40 people to handle these extra 2,000 claims. And so those 40 people will work those 2,000 claims down to a manageable level until the staff adjusters can, can begin working on those claims by themselves. And from there, they'll send the uh, independent adjusters home, right? Or they'll end their, what we call a deployment. Deployment is essentially just a work contract, mm-hmm. but it's industry, industry speak for a job. You know, so we say deployment. So, um, you know, so those, those deployments, it can last anywhere from a few weeks, a few months, sometimes a few years, just depending on the workload that's, that's available to them. Makes sense. So you take on the excess capacity in terms right. of basically fill it, filling out the paperwork and, right. and uh, managing the claim. Um, okay. I, I, I would imagine that like in, in a, a normal time where things stay constant, the insurance companies can more or less predict uh, you know, this, their supply and demand dynamics. But I think right. it's when there's kind of like large scale material adverse events that they mm-hmm. probably need to bring people on, whether that be you know, a flood in New Orleans or a, you know, a hurricane or, uh, or a flood things, things like that, right? Yeah, like wildfires, floods, hurricanes, hailstorms. <clears throat> These things cause widespread scale damage when they need thousands of people at one time. And so what I taught my students to do is how to get licensed, uh, where, to, where to apply to to get hired, and when, you know, and the skills needed to not only get hired, but to stay hired, right? Mm-hmm. And so because of the pandemic, this job was almost never remote. Like literally almost never. You know, it was very hard to get a remote position. But once the pandemic came, like probably 80% of my students at one point were, were working remote. Mm-hmm. That's like 300 people. 300, 300 people have gotten, probably had over 300 students now get hired. But at that time, I had a lot of students working remote. You know, so they were able to make a, you know, a strong income. Like I had seven students make over six figures and most of them made that from home, you know. That's pretty cool. So it is kind of like opportunistic work or do, do people find that they have worked throughout the years or it's just something that they can kind of pick up on evenings and weekends and they're just kind of on the bench? Well, it all depends. Now, you're not going to do evening and weekends. That's, that's usually not going to happen. What it's going to be normally is kind of like what you said, opportunistic. There'll be seasons. All right. So you might work for six months out of a year, eight months out of a year, 10 months out of a year. Or you might be a person to say, hey, I want to work full time. And so you'll be looking for new deployments all the time. So you'll finish one and go straight to the next one. So it just depends on what you want out of it. You know, I've had instances where I worked eight months out of the year and I was done. Other times I did 18 months straight. It just depends on what you want. Definitely makes sense. Uh, one or two last questions about it. So there are, you know, full-time adjusters at Geico and Progressive and all these Correct. companies, and then they have too much work and then they need to bring in the at- independent adjusters. Is right. there, I, I imagine there's probably some sort of like friction or dynamic where the full-time guys are kind of like, you know, that maybe they look at an independent guy's claims or like the work he did and they're like, ah, like these independent guys, like they're, they don't really know how yep. to do it. <laughs> you yeah, know what I, I mean? It happens, bro. <laughs> it happens sometimes. It just depends. Like, for some, it depends on how the insurance carriers present the adjusters. So, like, for example, I'm not going to use names of companies, but there are some companies they hate independent adjusters. They're like, man, these guys are getting paid too much. We deserve to get paid more money. They don't need to be here. And then you have other ones that are like, we're so happy that these independent adjusters are here because we need the help. We're struggling over here. Right. So it just all depends on basically how, like I said, how the adjusters are presented. Right, right, right. And is it sort of per hour based or do they incentivize you? Is it based on sort of like the size of the claim at all and you work bigger deals and you get more money or is it more kind of like per deal per hour? All right. So it's a bit of both, actually. So we have something called day rate. So they'll pay you X amount of dollars per day. No hourly, no what would be like a we call it fee schedule. But for the sake of conversation, we'll say commission. Uh, we don't say commission in the, in the uh, industry. We say fee schedule, but 
it essentially means fee schedule. It essentially means commission. So basically, what it means is, um, as you see more damage on a property, if you were to go out and inspect it uh, in the field, and let's say you found fifty thousand dollars worth of damage, you get paid off of a uh, off of off the idea that you made you found much more damage. But if you only found five thousand dollars of damage, you get you get paid less, right? So uh, we we get three three different ways: day rate. Fee schedule, which would be kind of like commission, and then a regularly hourly rate. Okay. Okay. Cool stuff. And um, when did you start um, teaching other people how to do this? Man, so like formally in 2020. That's when I, I dropped the course. But I was getting people in the industry since 2017. But it was like a one on one thing. And but I was telling them everything I tell them in the course. I was I was doing the same thing. It was just. I wasn't doing it at scale yet. And how did you? Uh, how did how did it go? Dropping your first course, like it must have been, a, uh, you know, a largely unknown area. You didn't know if it was going to work out. You don't know how much money you were going to make. If it was worth the investment of your time. How did that? How did that kind of go down? Yeah, bro. So that was that was a little crazy, man. So like, I got talked into. I got talked into making the course. I didn't want to make it. As a matter of fact, somebody else on Twitter was like, "Yo." They asked me because I never talked about what I actually did for a living. Because at that point, I was already in Brazil. Mm-hmm. And I already been in Brazil almost a year. And they were like, yo, like, so what do you do? And I explained what I did, kind of like what you just asked me. And she was like, Steve, you should make a course about this. And I was like, yeah, whatever. I mean, I guess maybe I'll do it. And I kind of just like messed around with it, procrastinated. And then one day I did a pre-sale. And uh, I did a pre-sale for a month. And then that month I made the course. I did eleven grand the first thirty days on, on the, the pre-sale. Yeah, on pre-sale, I did eleven thousand dollars. Damn, and that was it, bro. <laughs> the rest was history, man. I was like, well, I think I got, I think I got a hit on my hands. That's a, uh, you know what? It, it it does sound like it's a a ten year overnight success though, because like you said, you were cultivating your network for a decade before that. I was, I was, man. You know, also with that being said, like I have people like Lawrence King, for example. I don't know if y'all know Lawrence King, big guy yep. Yep. In, the, in, the, in the South American circle, you know, this whole expat circle. But Lawrence King, like I met Lawrence before I made my course. Like I took some of Lawrence's courses before I made my course. Like I had already saw how Tate marketed his courses. I had already seen how several people who did well and who are doing well, I saw how they were marketing, right? Um, I, I was studying emails from Ben Settles. I was studying copywriting. I was, you know, I, I did a lot. Of, I, I, I did a lot of back end work before I made the course. Um, so you, you approached it the right way. Yeah, I took it. Because see the thing, I, I had been in the insurance industry at that point. I, I've been in the insurance industry since, since 2008. But if you're going to get in the internet industry, internet marketing specifically, that is not something you want to just hop into because you're going you're gonna to mess up a lot of money. Right. You know? Yeah, and, there's definitely um, a method. Yeah, so I, st- I studied for two years on all those things. And so when I dropped my course, I kind of knew how to put everything together at that point. I kind of knew how to stack my skills. My skills have been stacked and I knew how to use, execute which ones I needed to execute. You know, and I built a good reputation as well. I built a really good reputation and I showed my lifestyle uh, often. And so it was easy to vouch for me. You see, did you meet Lawrence King in person? I did. I did meet Lawrence King in person. Where did you get? Where? Where? What city? He came to my city. I was in Salvador, Brazil. Oh shit. Yeah, man. We we came. Uh, I've met a few. I've met a few of the Latin America guys in person, man. Uh, but yeah, we had me and Lawrence had dinner together. Uh, drinks, everything. We had a great time. Well, he doesn't drink, but uh, I was drinking. But uh, we had a great time, man. And Lawrence has helped me out a lot as far as the on the internet business side of things. Yeah, I, you know what? I, I, can, can I ask you to do a little bit of a name dropping of kind of who you, who you've met up with over the years? Bro, I've met a lot of people, bro. Like Dylan Madden, obviously. I don't know if y'all know Dylan Madden or not. I think Dylan has an amazing story. Yeah, we just did an interview. We just we just posted our interview with Dylan Madden uh, like a week ago. Bro, Dylan, 
that's my dog, man. Like I've met Dylan several times. Um, oh really? I don't know if you know Logan Fitz. He's not a. He was doing this. He was doing this thing in Latin America for a bit, but he was more like in and out kind of situation. He was there for like two, three months, you know. Kicked it with him in Sao Paulo. Um, who else, man? Um, what's my dog there? I don't want to say his real name, but uh, his his name is like Latin American 007. Okay. I don't know if you know him or not. Um, he came. He kicked it with me in, in Salvador. Then I hung out with him in Sao Paulo. Um, see some more Brazilian guys, some more Brazil guys. Yusuf Watif, he died, but um, he was like one of the first guys who pulled me in before I came to Brazil. He kind of like schooled me up on Brazil, you know. Uh, he died of COVID uh, last summer, but uh, he was a wealth of knowledge about Latin America, and he kind of gave me the lay of the land. Uh, so I spent a lot of time with him in Sao Paulo as well. Uh, who else? Uh, do you want to know like Twitter personalities I hung out with too, or just like straight up Latin American people? Uh, yeah, a bit of both. I mean, offense, yeah. same thing. Then like you know, y'all know Zuby. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Zuby, that's my dog. I kicked it with him in New York. Uh, my boy Soul Bra, <laughs> kicked it with him. That's my dog, man. Uh, Rivalino, the Green Line guy. Yeah, you met that guy. Hell yeah, man! I kicked it with him too, man, in Spain. Who else? How old is that dude? I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna give you any specifics, bro. I'm pretty sure. I I get the vibe. He's like 50. <laughs> not 50. Everybody knows not 50, but he's old. <laughs> I will not give away his identity. Okay. Who uh, are Fury? Um, I kicked it with him. You know, y'all know. You know who are Fury? Um, no, nah, I don't know that one. Some of some of the listeners might know him. Uh, I was kicking with him in the Netherlands. Uh, Niels, it's a cat artist, cat uh, from the, uh, from a Dutch guy from the Netherlands as well. Kicked it with him. Kicked with some guys out like Morocco, Sammy Dendane, from Height Fury. Uh, shit, who else, man? Like I, I, I did kick with some people, bro. Yeah, it's a pretty extensive list, man. That was more than a dozen. Yeah, man. Like we're not mentioning the women either. So <laughs> the women from Twitter, so. Have you yeah. um have you met up with Dylan Madden in the in the, in the U.S. because he's he's from South Carolina? You guys could have been around the the states. Bro, too. we never met in the states, man. Never. That's just crazy, man. Like we met. I bumped in this. Let me, let me think. I saw. I got. I I, got, I hung out with uh, Dylan twice in Brazil. Never in the United States. Uh, I'm probably gonna go to Paraguay and see him in another, mm-hmm. in another couple months. Yep. But uh Dylan, that's my dog, man. Like, that's cool. Yeah. Man, yeah. We, I, I might I might be down there in, in Paraguay around the same time. Oh shit, we need to kick it too, man. Um I'm trying to yeah. think who else man. I'm like, dude, I, I'm here in Canada just bre- just dreaming all day about Brazil <laughs> and doing a little Nordest G tour. Bro, you need to come hey man. You need to come up to Bahia, bro. I'm telling you, man, I'll show you a good time. I'm definitely into it. Um, yeah. So I, my, my thought would be like, uh, why Brazil? Uh, how did you, did you kind of start with Brazil or did you start with other parts of Latin America first or, or Europe as you mentioned? Yeah, man. So, um, let's, let's talk into the, let's talk about some nuts and bolts real quick. So for me, bro, um, I chose Brazil because of the problems I had in Canada. All right. So when I was in Canada, I'm black. Obviously, we talked. We already said that earlier, but I'm black, and the Africans that I was around gave me a lot of problems in Canada. It was giving me a lot of shit, man, and I didn't like it. You know, I didn't like that. I also didn't like that everybody knew I was an American. You know, so I wanted to be in a place where I blended in. I was in the Western Hemisphere. And it was still going to be good weather. And so it was going to be either Colombia, obviously the Caribbean, or Brazil. The Caribbean was out for me just because of weather. I didn't want to be stuck anywhere where I could get a hurricane and then, like, I wouldn't have internet service. I thought about Colombia, but I was just like, eh, no, I'm not doing Colombia. I had never been to Brazil, but I knew Brazil had a lot of black people. So I was like, I'll go and... Also, I knew that Brazil, it wasn't just a black country. It had everybody there. 
anybody can be Brazilian, you know, just as far as right. looks. Um, right. But I was like, let me go here and let's see how it is. So I went for six weeks and it was completely opposite. So like when I got to Brazil, everybody just thought I was Brazilian. They didn't think I was American at all. <laughs> like no one thought I was American. And so this helped a lot, you know, just from a learning culture standpoint, because in Canada, and it's crazy that you would think that in Canada, it would be an easy, you know, easy thing to blend in there, but it, it wasn't. Um, but in Brazil, I was going to, I was in the favela, like on day three of being in the country. Like I'm deep in a favela, like hanging out, drinking, you know, drinking at a bar and I, I didn't have any problems. I didn't speak the language yet, but everybody just assumed I was one of them. So that, that helped me a ton, man. Like flying on, under the radar. Um, I haven't had any issues because I just don't like a gringo until I started talking, you know, then it'd be like, eh, you don't know Portuguese like that. So where are you from? <laughs> you know, did, did they ever have trouble with your English? Um, you know, in, in Brazil, bro, it's very few people who do speak English. So I was pulling that Google translate out a lot. Um, but I think that, um, no, I didn't have any problems. I didn't have any problems, bro. It was, just, it was really more like people were patient with me. And I was trying to, you know, I was trying to speak Portuguese. And because I was trying and they could see I was getting better, I was, I got a lot of grace. You know what I'm saying? Like people were very patient, man. And then also, once I got into Brazil, I wasn't being a nomad inside Brazil. I was in the same city the whole time. You posted up in, in Salvador the whole time. Yeah, bro. Like, I got to Salvador. That was it, bro. I didn't go to Rio until this year, until year three. I had never <laughs> set foot in Rio de Janeiro, bro. <laughs> you feel me? That's funny. That was yeah, funny. man. So, but I was able to build connections there because of time, you know, um, and build relationships and build, like, deep connections because I was there every day, you know. And I think that's something that a lot of people – they don't, they don't, uh, what's what I'm looking for? They don't, um, they don't value that once they get out of the, the, their home country and they'll start like, they'll go to like four cities in Brazil in three months. I'm like, well, you know, you don't know anybody by the way, and nobody cares about you and everybody just forgot about you already. Why'd you do that? You know, just pick one place and stay there. That's what I think. Yeah. You know, what's funny is on the, on the Dylan Madden episode we did, we, we actually talked quite a bit about the idea of locking down a city. He kind of mm -hmm. got that from Andrew Tate um, and how the Tates kind of locked down Romania and uh, how they just, they just uh, valued the idea of being able to rock up to a restaurant. Everyone knows their name and get yeah. that, get that good service. And uh, Dylan kind of took that to heart and, and Dylan likes that too. He likes, you know, tipping well, Going mm -hmm. back to the same place for dinner every single night. You yep. Know. Yep. And I'm 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 in the I'm in the Tate school of thought because I learned that from the Tates as well. You know, I'm I'm reading this stuff on Twitter just like everybody else is, you know. So like for me it was like, okay, um, if I'm gonna do this, it's time to do it. I go to the same restaurant four or five times a week. Everybody knows my name, everybody knows the type of people I bring over, how I dress. You know, but the thing is, like, like, like to, to what the Tate say, what Dylan said, probably told y'all on the, on the thing. It's like, yo, man, you get treated better. You know, when you're not some random gringo and you treat people with respect, you get a much better experience out of these countries, wherever you are in the world. And uh, how, how did you first decide on Salvador? Was that the first city you rocked up to? Yeah, bro. Well, yeah, to my point, that was a city that was going to be the blackest. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was going to make me blend in the best. You know, I was like, I know that we have some danger. You know, some just, you know, it's, Salvador is can be dangerous. And Brazil in general is not the safest place. And so I was like, I got to give myself some advantages here. And so I wanted to go to the place where I would blend in the best. And so Salvador was the best place for me to blend in at. And that helped out a ton because also there wasn't a lot of gringos there. Um, it's not a lot of gringos who, there, who, who are there regularly. And so people weren't treating me with 
like this. I didn't get gringo priced all the time. I wasn't getting like scammed and stuff. You know what I mean? Right, right, right. Like there's not that much of an economy around. Like like oh. people do go to Salvador, don't get us wrong. Like people go, yeah. but they'll go for like a weekend, a week, maybe mm-hmm. during Carnival. Yeah. Um, but other than that, like I, I d- personally don't hear of too many gringos that are posting up digital nomad style for multiple months. They're not. They're not there, bro. They're not there. And it's and it's, it's, it's a shame because I think Salvador and specifically Bahia in general, it has so much um, nature to offer, man. It's, it's such a beautiful place. But it's, it intimidates most people because of the language barrier. Yeah, I think um, almost every Brazilian, if you ask a Brazilian, what is your favorite state in Brazil? They almost always say Bahia. Yep. Yep, exactly. But I think you gotta have you have the, you have to have the courage to go and stay, and it's so few people, men or women, anywhere in the Western world that come to Salvador and be like, "I'm staying." And I think that um, to Dylan's point, to Tate's the Tate's point is like, "Yo, if you cannot play well with others long term in a place like Salvador, you're not gonna win. You're just not gonna win, bro, because it's not like Rio de Janeiro where everything." Tur- tourist wise or gringo wise is right there in front of you. You got to go find it. And if you can't do that, yeah, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna have some problems. I'll put it like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, t- tell people a little bit about Bahia and what makes Bahia like a unique state within Brazil. Okay, so Bahia is like the size of France, first of all. Um, it has like hundreds of miles of coastlines, has a, like like two dozen islands, all right? And they like, it's like the Caribbean islands, by the way. It's not like just some bullshit island. Right? These are like beautiful islands. Um, yeah. Great food. It's like the, when people like, you know, people talk about food in Brazil, the Brazilians, they really like Bahian food. Um, the water is really warm yep. there as well. Um, you can basically hop in the water year round. If you ever, any of y'all ever been to Rio, Rio, as y'all know, has cold water. So Rio is beautiful, but you can't enjoy the beach. You can be on the beach, but you can't, you can't get in the water. Like in Bahia, you can go, you know, uh, scuba diving, spear fishing, you know, surfing, just hop in the water literally any time of the year, and it's going to be warm. And so that's something that's special about Bahia as well. And then just a slower pace, you know, it's a much slower pace, and the people are very hospitable. and it's just real, like, saw the earth type people, man. Like, I, I really enjoy Bahia. And there's so many, like, just secluded places, with, like, four people on the beach. Sometimes you go to beaches, nobody's on the beach, bro, just because it's that much coastline. You just be on beaches where there's literally nobody, you know. Uh, on some of these islands, you know, it's just, it's special, man. It's really, really special. And I, I think I've done a good job of hiding that because I don't post all my pictures. <laughs> <laughs> And it, it, the coastline, I, I know, is unbelievable, and it looks Caribbean, uh, mm-hmm. perfect, perfect beaches. But it's a it, the state goes quite uh, deep into the interior of Brazil, too, and it's yeah. quite varied, right? Like, it kind of yeah. almost becomes like a desert or mountainous. It I think, does. I don't know if it's Bahia, but there's like, there's like these like secret, secret like mining towns or something like that. Yes, yeah, Bahia, um, Chapada. So they have these, they have this, um, it's, a, it's a mining town called Linsoyes. Um, in Chapada de Manchina. So there's this huge national park inside Bahia uh, called Chapada de Manchina. And it's like, imagine like a green Grand Canyon. That's, it's that type of look, you know, like they have these secluded waterfalls, like all these waterfalls, like insane waterfalls. Then they have all these cave, it's a, it's a whole cave system in there. And it's just, for one state to have islands and have caves and mountains and and all these like nature trails and everything it's really like it's almost overwhelming how pretty it can be yeah i'm actually pulling up my google maps because i do have some stars on but yeah i do have Ch- uh, chapada diamantina yeah um as a star there's another spot i don't know if you've heard of this it's called like uh kaite asu Kaiteasu. It's another mm. uh, small town in there with like, yeah, Kaiteasu. Is it in Chapala de Machina? Uh, it's it's near there. It's near there. Yeah. It's, so there, there's a bunch of small um, towns. But yeah, long story short, there's like, 
there's all these small towns that are really really cool like what is what is kind of the interior of bahia like have you spent some time in there yes i have i have man like so y'all know i'm from alabama so this is what i'm used to i'm used to rural areas you know i'm used to like a lot of farm it's like a lot of farmland too bro it's a ton of farmland very slow Mm -hmm. pace uh, of living out there um and it's sparsely populated you know so you're not just going to be bumping into people like these are like real deal small towns um but just it's just great people overall and like even the drive like drive from driving from salvador to chapala g is six hours beautiful drive beautiful drive is safe uh, i drove there and back um you, you you'll rarely see police you know it's pretty decent roads the whole way i had cell phone service probably 80 percent of the way um and i had a ball you know i had a ball in the interior but um the interior in bahia is famous during fojos during uh for fojo so during san juan uh so that's in uh in june <coughs> there's a lot of so basically everybody in bahia in like places like salvador larger france is like the cities they go to the interior to to celebrate uh, San Juan, uh, and it's basically like a country carnival. <laughs> like that's the best way I can explain it. Like everybody puts their like flannel shirts on and cowboy boots, yeah. and they go dance fojo in, in all these small countryside towns. And, and um, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty cool experience. Yeah, I like the sound of that. I I think um, I. I I'm deeply interested in, in seeing more of Bahia, especially because like Salvador is interesting and, and we can talk more about the city of Salvador, mm-hmm. but you know, it is known for being dangerous. And I, I think I would kind of have problems there personally if I, if I spent a lot of time there, but I, I have a feeling and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I have a feeling if you can just get out of the city of Salvador and see the rest of the state, the rest of the state, you'll be able to let your guard down a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. it's going to be, you know, cleaner, cheaper, good food, um, dance for ho, sick yeah. waterfalls. It must be dope, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, I mean, I'll put it like this. Salvador is not like Rio or Sao Paulo, which you, where you really got to pay attention, right? Like I walk around my cell phone out all the time. You know, if I'm in a restaurant outside, I'll have my cell phone on the table. You know, Salvador is dangerous, but it's dangerous in the favelas. All the places you're going to be more than likely have tourist police by there. And so you can walk freely most most parts of the day, right? Any you know, anywhere in the world you're walking around at eleven o'clock at night, you're at higher risk of something happening to you just because it's late at night, right? But for the most part, Salvador, in my experience and how, <clears throat> how I've seen Gringos experience Salvador, I haven't heard of anybody being like, yo, I got robbed. Somebody stole my cell phone. They might have stole some. They might have got got a phone, cell phone stolen a lot because they left it in a bag or something like that. But I haven't had any of my friends like get strong or robbed or beat up or something like that. You know, really, it, it, I heard it was like pretty. Like I heard it could get a little like zombies walking around. You know, like no, like, no, nah, nah, that's old. That's old Salvador, bro. That's like 2015, 2016. They stopped all that. Okay. They really uh, Salvador is really trying to to clean their Im- image up with tourists. And so they stopped all that, bro. That's yeah. Like Pelerino is an is a famous tourist area. It used to be like that. It used to be like that in Rio Romeo as well. But they stopped all that, though. They cleaned it up, man. And it's uh, I haven't seen that in my time there at all. You know, um, I would say if anything, the tourist areas have gotten safer over the last three years. Okay, yeah, I, I believe that because I think a lot of these anecdotes probably might come from like the mid two thousand tens. Yeah, yeah, and they were right back then. They were right for sure. That's exactly how it was back then, but not now. No, no, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I, it, you know, I, you probably know we have city guides on our website to mm-hmm. cities in Brazil and other places in Latin America. Mm-hmm. And I, I was actually recently reading the just today actually I was reading the uh, Recife uh, city guide we have. And the, mm-hmm. the conclusion to the Hesifi Recife uh, city guide, it says, uh, it says, um, how did it put it? It was like, um, cause it was written by the, the previous, uh, Vance, but mm-hmm. he said, um, 
uh, he, he said like Recife is, is unsafe, but you're not compensated with having like a six city the way Salvador is. So uh, something with the, with something for an equal level of danger as Recife, yeah. you might as well just go to Salvador where it's like actually a, a cool dynamic place. And I yeah. know like, you know, it's, it kind of, it's, it's kind of similar to Portugal a little bit. They have those, um, what's it called? Uh, like elevators and it's very, yeah, hilly. yeah, I do. Yeah. Yeah. They got all that, man. I think, but I think the other Vance makes a point though. You know, like if you're going to be in a dangerous, dangerous place, you need to get a payoff for it. You know, <laughs> I've never wanted to go to Mississippi ever. And that's because I heard they had sharks in the water. I don't want to like, I don't want to deal with sharks. In Salvador, I can just hang out in the water all day long. Nothing's going to happen to me. I'm just going to get soggy. You know, that's it. But like, Hasifi, I haven't heard enough good things about it, whether it's the women, the nightlife, or the uh, the overall scene for me to want to go. And uh, yeah, just, just give us like a little, little bit more color on Salvador. Like what is maybe what's kind of like a day in the life or what are the top attractions? Or if someone was to visit you, someone was to reach down, like, mm -hmm. what are you going to show them? Man or woman, before I start this conversation. Uh, one of the, I mean, I think our audience is probably primarily male. So if one of the internet bros comes down. Ah, man. So um, when Lawrence came down, I showed him some spots, some restaurants, things like that. Uh, when some of my friends have come down, it's really been, I really wanted them to see the nature and how beautiful it is before anything, right? Every, every, every city in the world has women. Right. Um, I want to show them restaurants that are a little more high end um, because, you know, you can get a street whatever in any place. In, every place in the world has a street version of their food. Right. Some cheap five dollar thing or two dollar thing. Right. And so I try to skip past that. I also don't I try to skip past the tourist beaches. So I want to show you stuff that you wouldn't see. Uh, those are the beaches that's off the beaten path. Some views that's off the beaten path. Some, you know, sunset views. So. So Salvador is called uh, the city of the sunset. So, like, bro, it's some insane views for sunset. It doesn't make any sense, dog. Seriously. It's beautiful. Like, people, like, applaud the sunset. Literally, like, they clap their hands on the beach. Um, and then as far as, like, the nightlife, bro, Rio Vermeil, it's just a neighborhood in the city, man. Like, just pumping, man. Tons of clubs, tons of bars, man. A lot of shit you can get into there. You can walk on foot. <clears throat> You're not going to have any problems. Uh, all night long in that area. Uh, another one is Pelotinho. So Pelotinho is like the old city. It's like a, it's like 450 years old, 470 years old, something like that. And um, that's usually where all your concerts are going to be at, at night. And so if you want to do a samba show, you want to see Foho, you want to see Pagoji, Pagadon, uh, like any of those music genres, they're going to be in Pelotinho. And it's going to be like famous artists, bro. You're going to meet, you're going to see like the big artists. In Peladino, uh, Salvador just made a convention center, so like uh, that's where some of the, like newer contemporary artists are. Like the big, big shows with several thousand people, they'll be over there uh, in Costa Azul. And then like uh, for my guys that want to have a little more fun, you know, there's another set of clubs I can take them to. Um, if you catch my drift, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh, it's it's got a lot for it's got a lot. Salvador has a lot to offer, and I think it's cheaper than Rio. It's safer than Rio, and and don't think that just because you're not black, you wouldn't be able to blend in, dog. Like, you'll blend in for the most part, okay? Um, <clears throat> just be cool. As long as you're cool, bro, everybody else is going to be cool. Once you start being, like, reckless, aggressive, uh, I had an incident with a guy, an American, I told my flight, I kind of have pet peeves. I'm sure you got your own pet peeves about, uh, you know, gringos. And I told my friend, I said, look, bro, I don't want to meet anybody that doesn't speak Portuguese. Right. And so uh, this happened in Rio de Janeiro. But this is something that's just you shouldn't do this anywhere in the world. In but in Brazil, these guys do not play about their women. OK. And this guy, I told in him, I was like, hey, bro. specifically, well, just in general, in Brazil, in general, these Brazilian dudes are not playing about their women. So, like. This guy, yeah, they're really protect, overprotective, and you cannot just try to holler at one of the girls. You know what I'm saying? So the guy goes up to this girl, and he's trying to get, he's trying to get her number, but he doesn't realize because he doesn't speak Portuguese. He doesn't realize that that's her boyfriend that he, that's next to him. 
And so the dude punches him. You know, he gets sucker punched because he was trying to talk to somebody's girlfriend. And he comes back mad, like, Steve, what the hell, man? Like, we got to go fight those guys. I was like, no, we not. We ain't doing shit. You going to do it. <laughs> I didn't have anything to do with that. You know, I understood that that was her boyfriend. You didn't. You know, so long as you don't do things like that, you're not going to have a problem with anybody, bro. Okay, that's good to hear. That's good yeah. to hear. And then uh, you, uh, if if it was a girl that was going to visit you in Salvador, what, what would you do differently? I mean, it would be the same thing. I think it would just be a, a difference in, like, I will probably try to connect her to some girls I know there. Um, and it just depends. Because, like, some people, especially women I see, they come to Salvador for religion. So uh, condom blay is a big-time religion in, in Salvador, okay? Um, they have something called Imanja Festival. So you'll see women come down because they want to connect into a different spiritual system, right? Um, I do see people like that, and I usually try to connect those women with other women that are on that. Um, I will say that some women come down to explore themselves sexually. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so tantric is really big out there. Tantric massage, tantric sex, all that type of stuff. So you'll see it's, it's little enclaves of that as well. Um, it's it's bro, it's a mix. It's a mixed pot, man. You know what I mean? Like it's a lot you can get out of Salvador, and a lot you can give to Salvador if you're uh, willing to be open, man or woman. You know. Mm -hmm. And do you think? People are typically like the typical uh, tourist or or flow of foreigners into Salvador. Is it people coming down from the north, or is it people coming up from the south? Of <coughs> it's people coming from from the south, usually. Yeah, yeah. It's they want the better the weather. South. They want a little Caribbean type vibe. Yeah, yeah. You'll see. As far as Brazilians, you'll see a lot of people from Sao Paulo and a lot of people from Rio come up to Salvador. A lot. Specifically, Sao Paulo, um, you'll see a lot of um, a lot of Europeans come to Salvador. Um, who else comes? But as far as in country, it's a lot of people from the south, bro. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, definitely makes sense. All right, um, I'm going to ask you about a couple different spots within the state of Bahia, mm -hmm. um, and maybe you could just give me give us a little bit of a breakdown on like what the vibe is or what you know about these okay. places. Um, okay. Should be should be pretty. Uh, you'll you'll know these spots. You'll know these. Spots. Okay. 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 So the first one is uh, you definitely know this spot, which is uh, Moho G Sao Paulo. Moho G Sao Paulo. Moho G Sao Paulo. Bro, that shit is pumping, boy. Yeah, that's the vibe there. Pumping, dog. Oh my god, bro. Yeah, man, that's a spot, man. <laughs> that is a spot, man. I had a ball there. I highly recommend it for New Year's. Any of your big holidays in Brazil, I recommend Moho G Sao Paulo. Um, you're it's a four hour ride from Salvador via boat. Um, it's huge as far as tourists, you know, tourism is concerned. Like there's uh, four beaches. So there's beach one, beach two, three, and four. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have some really nice hotels on the, on the island. They have a ton of food options, ton of shopping options, ton of alcohol. If you steal, they will kill you. Okay. So don't come down there trying to steal from nobody. Because the cops will get you or the gang members will get you. and uh, But that's to your favor if you're not a thief because it's really safe, you know. Um, they have some clubs there that's pumping as well. Um, so it's, it's yo, man, I'm I'm a fan. I'm a fan of Mojo de Sao Paulo. And then, and then there's another the island. Internet pretty good there. I have a buddy. I have a buddy that spent time there as a digital nomad. The, is the internet like workable for a month? And, and I wouldn't do. Home? I wouldn't do any of the islands for a month, bro. None of them. Um, Moho is better than let's say uh, Morere or Boy Peba. Uh, but the 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 if you need to go for a weekend or a week, and you had you know you had some stuff you need to handle, you could get it done. But I couldn't get real business done when I was in Moho. Yeah, it makes sense. All right. Um, the next one is a place uh, a little further south ca called uh, Baja Granji. Baja, Baja Granji. Baja Granji. <clears throat> yeah. Granji. That's another tourist spot. Another tourist spot. You know, so before before we go into all these cities, just know that you're, 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 you're rallying off like tourist places. Right. And so these are going to be seasonally hot. Right. 
Um, it de- it's going to depend on how good your Portuguese is. Are you dating somebody down there or are you just coming in for a couple weeks, three weeks, right? If you're coming in around holiday season for a place like Baja Granger, you're going to have a good time. If you're coming in just like right now, for example, in July, it's going to be lame because it's the rainy season right now, you know? Right. So it would suck to be in Baja Granger right now unless you were like in a serious relationship with somebody, you know? Makes sense. It, but it's like, and it's smaller than, uh, than mobile. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. Is one of those two places uh, like pedestrian only, no cars? Mojo do São Paulo is pedestrian only. Um, any of the islands are going to be pedestrian only for the most part. Almost exclusively, they're going to be pedestrian only. Or there'll be bikes. You just see bikes everywhere. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Next place, just keep on. We just keep going down the yeah, coast is uh, Itacare. 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 Same thing. Same thing, man. Same rules apply. I'm waiting for you to give me some good names so I can tell you some more. But Itacare, same thing as Baja Granji. Um, you you want to go on some like – Itacare is a cool place like on some like let's go for three days. Hey, me and my homeboys, hey, it's three or four of us. We got three or four other people with us. Let's go as a group, right? Um, if you're going solo, bro, eat – as far as Itacare, Itacare, Baja Grande, Mojo São Paulo, if you're not going during the peak season, don't go solo. Don't go solo. It's going to be much harder for you. Yeah, it's too small. Yeah, it's just way too small, man. Like, and it ain't a bunch of young women just floating around at that, at that, during those time periods, you know, because they all in Salvador and Rio Makes and sense. Sao Paulo. Makes well, sense. Um, and then the fourth one is a little bit bigger, which is uh, Ileus. Ileus, ah, see, I gotta give you, a, I gotta use some more names. It's, I'm putting them, all, I'm putting all those cities in the same bag, okay? They, I'm gonna they give you. Are. I, that's kind of what I wanted was like a little bit of the what's the difference? Yeah, they all we're gonna put them all in the same bag, bro. Like sleepy beach towns when it's not on the in the, in the, the peak season. Fortaleza is Fortaleza on that list. You mean like the actual Fortaleza in the northeast? No. Yeah, in the northeast. Yeah, it's in that's in Bahia. Well, not it's not in Bahia, but it's in the northeast. So, so yeah. Fortaleza. No, I, I was sticking just to Bahia stuff. Oh, so what about uh, uh, Trancoso? Did you put down there? Is that still in Bahia? But yeah, no, yeah, but it's in the south, in, uh, south of Bahia. So Trancoso, Bahia is so, huge, dog. I tell you, it's the size of France, bro. Like Bahia is so big. Bro, so Trancoso yeah. is, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like, bro, it's like the luxury area of Bahia, okay? You yeah, go down like there, you, bro, it's like Bali. It ain't like Tulum. It's like Bali, bro, as far as what you can get out there. And I'm, I'm not saying it's cheap. I'm saying as far as architecture, it's real, you know, barefoot chic type shit. You know what I'm saying? Like yachts and shit like that. You go down there, you better bring yeah. your wallet, Okay. Yeah. Um because there's it's, a bunch of spots right in there. So there's Caraiva, there's um there's uh Ahayao Giajuda, mm-hmm. uh there's uh Pichinga, mm-hmm. they're all kind of right beside each other. There's uh Taipei. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And you got all that, but that is a spot, you know, everybody digital nomad different. So everybody earns that money differently, right? But if I, I would do Trancoso if I wanted to do it like a, a a level up. You know what I'm saying? If I wanted to be like on some like some mm-hmm. some fly shit, I would do Trancoso for like Christmas, New Year's, or Carnival. Yeah, you know I would get do married it there. Yeah, it, it's it's beautiful. You know, um, but that's like an, again, hey, we got a group of 15 people. We, we rented out a a you know a big spot. We got two or three houses next to each other. I I would do a, a thing like that. In Trancoso, you know, rent a yacht, you know, yacht party, stuff like that. Yeah. I guess for people not looking at a map currently like I am. So those first three or four places that I named were all generally close to each other, closer mm-hmm. to the city of Salvador. And then uh, and then kind of, I don't know, uh, maybe 100 kilometers further south is where it starts. Porto Seguro, where I think there's mm-hmm. an airport. And then there's like Transcoso. 
and uh in Karaiva and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um all right. I'll give you one not on not on the, the coast, one that looked kind of interesting. And this is a town right near Salvador, but in the interior, but it looks big okay. enough that it might have its own vibe. You might know what I'm talking about. It is called uh Fera G Santana. Fera Santana. What do you know about Fera G Santana? Um I don't go there. I don't go to Fetish Santana just because um all right, how do I put this? Ha <sighs> okay. So what Salvador did to clean Salvador up a bit for like tourist areas and all that, they basically the police basically round up homeless people and like criminals and stuff like that and they just push them out into the interior. Okay. Uh that includes Lada G Fretas and that includes Fetaji Santana. All right. And so it can get real sketchy real quick out there. Um, and it doesn't get you anything better than Salvador. You know, so you have an increased level of danger, possibly, right? And for any Brazilians that's, that's listening to this right now, if I made a mistake, oh, well. But that's just my assumption because I don't hear anybody, all my Bahian friends, nobody's like, yo, you got to come to Fetiji sometime. Like, nobody's telling me that. You know, there might be like a big concert every once in a while, maybe, but it's nothing that you can't get in Salvador or Lona de Fretas for that matter. Um, but Fede de Santana, <clears throat> I've been through it driving to Spaji Machina. Um, but it's it's nothing that I would if you just felt like driving over there, do it, but like it's not yeah. anything where you just need to be like, yo, I'm going That's to That's good to know. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it just you know, sometimes those inland cities, the industrial cities, can be a, a gold mine. But it sounds like that's not the one. <laughs> they can, but like you got to think about it, bro. Like the interior of Bahia, like so, Bahia is already a slow paced, a slow paced state. In the, I'm living in a city of three million people, and it's still slow paced. In the interior, bro, it's sleepy, slow. Like nothing is going on, and also not only is nothing going on, like people are. You know, much, much, much more poor than they would be in, in in the city. You know, so that that yeah, influences. Sense. My life. So you mentioned uh, uh, you you mentioned Lauro G uh, Freitas a couple of times, yeah, which is yeah. just kind of like just north of the city mm -hmm. of, of Salvador. What's what's mm -hmm. going on in in Lauro G Freitas? In Laura, uh, so in Lauro G Freitas, man, it's like literally right there. It's just like the city right next to it, right next to Salvador. Um, they got a lot of clubs there, bro. A lot of clubs, man. Um, oh, yeah. you know, if you want to experience some different like shows for like younger people, um, you know, in some of their um music music genres, you go to Largy Fretas, man. They got a different type of chick out there too. Um, different looks, you know. So it's it's <clears throat> it's all right, man. But it's a place you would pop by. I wouldn't stay in Largy Fretas. You know what I'm saying? As a gringo, uh, you just don't have your your Portuguese is not that good mm -hmm. to go there. Go go by, pop up for the night, Uber back to the house, stay for a weekend type of thing. But yeah, you you really want to be well versed, you know, on your on your Portuguese and everything before you start uh, before you start you know popping up to lodge your yeah, just man. at random. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, we can kind of move on to a different format, but I'll, I'll I'll hit you with like one or two more. Let's go. Um, um, do you ever so the just to the north of the state of Bahia is the state of uh, Sergipe, if I'm pronouncing that right, Sergipe. Sergipe. Okay, yeah. Um, do you ever you ever get up there and go to the the capital of uh, Aracaju? I know what you're talking about, but I haven't I haven't been there. I haven't been there yet. It's so many islands in Bahia, bro. Like it's so many islands, man. You got to kind of pick a section of them and do it at a time, you know. Fair enough. Um. Well, and then you mentioned Fortaleza. Sounds like you want to talk about Fortaleza. Do you, do you want to talk about Fortaleza? It? Do you do you like the city? Now I'm gonna only tell you. I'm only gonna be able to tell you what I heard. All right, because I didn't. I've never been there, but it is the party. Like it's like. Some party shit, bro. Like, y'all want to party? You go to Fortaleza. You know, you want to leave Salvador? You still want to experience kind of like, you know, the tropical vibe, vibe and all that. Um, it's 
much wider, you know, um, <clears throat> and you'll see a lot of Europeans there. You'll see a lot of uh, Americans there during peak season, a great place to kick it for like a month, maybe a month and a half, two months during like, you know, December, January, or January, February, that lead up into carnival. Great place to hang out, man. Yeah, kind of similar to Salvador in, in that they're they're quite large cities. We're talking like 3 million yeah. people. And, and it's uh, safer too. Fortaleza is safer. Yeah. Yeah, man. It's, yeah, Fortaleza is kind of like the biggest one between – or sorry. I mean, it, it's almost like um, Salvador is at like the bottom part of the northeast. And mm -hmm. then there's all these like little state capitals along, along the mm -hmm. way. And they're all like apparently pretty good. I don't know the differences super well, but they're all like pretty good. Um, Aracaju, as I mentioned, Maceu, uh, Hesifi, yeah. Joao Pessoa, Natal, etc. Mm -hmm. And then at the very top of that is uh, Fortaleza, and then I guess arguably San Luis if you keep going. But um, but yeah, I feel like I feel like Fortaleza to Salvador is kind of like the corridor. Yeah, it is, man. And I think like you know, we I don't know how long guys will be there. Um, but <clears throat> if you have the time, I would pick one major city to kick it in and I would pick one of these areas to start to explore. If you can do that, you're going to get a really good lay of the land. Like I, I've been there for like three and a half years, guys. So like I didn't do all this in three months. Okay. This took me, you know, years like, oh, I forgot to go to Chapala G. Manchina this year. I gotta go next year. Or, you know, hey, I want to go to this island. So like. I did I did Moho my second year in Brazil. I did Chapada Gima I, I did I did Chapada this year, like three months ago, four months ago, you know. So like and then just hearing guys being in Fortaleza or hearing about these places several times and asking about them, that's how I learned like all this stuff about them. And then obviously some places I went to, clearly. Yeah, man. Um <laughs> so I, I gotta tell you, we don't normally we try to not talk about dating on my Latin life just okay. because, um, you know what I mean? I, I, I know I'm not trying mean. to get canceled or anything, but, I got you, but I got you. we, we try to, we try to touch upon nightlife and stuff like that mm -hmm. to give people an enough of an idea of what the vibe is and then they can go mm -hmm. explore it for themselves. But Perfect. maybe you could just tell us a little bit about what the, in a PG way, tell us a little bit yeah. about how nightlife in Salvador works and actually kind of how the dating market works like, um, and kind of how you've chosen to navigate the, the dating market. Cause I'm just guessing you're probably one of the top guys. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. I'm a, we're going to do PG bro. I can, I can, I can tell you for real, for real when we get off record, record live, we're not recording, but just for the sake of this conversation, guys, I'm gonna keep it PG. I don't know what everybody's goals are. So in Bahia, women are much more traditional in in the sense of uh what they want right so you know um they they'll sleep with you quickly right you you you'll sleep with a girl first night maybe second time you see her that's that's normal that does not mean she is in love with you okay that's just how it is all right that's just a girl you know y'all go on the first date is going well you're going to sleep with her probably more than likely you know um if not, at least you're going to make out. But they're doing that because they want to confirm that the physical is there, all right? The chemistry is there before anything goes any further because they're really big on chemistry. Hmm. Um, another thing, this was taught to me by my Uber driver when I got there. He was like, look, man, it's illegal not to have sex every day in, in Bahia. I said, what? He was like, yeah, it's illegal. So Bahia and women are known for their uh, sexual appetites. Now, with that being said, that don't mean it's just going to be this fall in your lap, right? You still got to be a cool guy. Um, in Bahia, women respect masculinity a lot more. So if you're coming from the West, uh, Western men, whether we're American, Canadian, Australian, European, we are a lot more passive than a Brazilian man would be. And so when you aren't being as aggressive, these women will just think you're gay, okay? Either you don't like them or, or you're gay. Right. And so um, that whole like waiting to kiss a girl, waiting to hold hands with her, touch her kind of stuff. She that's a negative for her. So you got to kind of ramp that up a bit because uh, because that's what she's used to. 
also they're used to being men being a, a bit more masculine even in relationships right so like I, I just tell my friends like you have to up the masculinity when you get down here because you know whatever you think you are just up it a couple more levels and you'll be okay uh, but being like scared to kiss a girl scared to approach a girl like all that is a great way not to not to win down there you know am i being am i, am I being pg enough Vince? That was slightly less PG than I was expecting, but I okay. think I'm sure the audience is loving it. And uh, I think you're still <laughs> within bounds. Keep going. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So um, that's that. I will say that. Um, yeah. So like down there in Bahia, you're gonna be more of a. You can be a player a bit, but it ain't anywhere in the world being a player ain't gonna really work. You have to really like keep it on the wraps. You know what I'm saying? Um, you're not gonna be out here like ten girls in a, in a in a club type situation, and it's just you. That's not happening. But um, you know, usually I most of the men I know that come down, they they usually have a girlfriend or a main girl within a month, maybe two months. That's just the norm. Um, because the women know how to take care of men. You know what I'm saying? Also, you know, they're not gonna take a whole bunch of disrespect either. Though, right? Like you will get you will get left just like anybody else. These are still women, right? Um, what else can I tell y'all? Um, Salvador is not like Rio. Any y'all who have a general idea of Rio and women, Salvador is not like that. Okay, so you come up to Salvador acting like you would act in Rio or trying to do the things you do in Rio with women in Salvador, you're gonna be in for a rude awakening for the average girl. What do you what yeah. do you mean by that? Uh, I'm trying to, also I'm trying to be PG now. Uh but uh what I mean by that is like, you know, you have guys that go to Rio and they're just paychecks. They're straight up pay girls, you know what I'm saying? And there's a culture of that in Rio. There's a lot of girls who are like, they, they're on Tinder, but they're escort. You know what I'm saying? So, like, you'll take them to dinner, and they're like, well, it's 300 hay ice for dinner. Yeah, you got to pay her 300 hay ice and take her to dinner. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it's a lot of that in Rio. You won't see that in Salvador. So, like, also, down in, uh, in Salvador, nobody speaks English, bro. Like, 99% of women you meet are not going to speak English. Don't even think that it's going to happen. And they and they don't like the fact that you won't try to speak Portuguese. They'll usually stop talking to you fairly quickly. You know, if you're being passive, you're not trying to speak Portuguese, and you can't dance or you don't want to try to dance, forget about it. It's not happening. If you have bad hygiene, you're not pulling chicks, bro. Forget about it. You don't want to take a shower. You got to take two showers a day down there in Brazil. Brazilians. Uh, value hygiene, you know, so it's, it's, a. Uh, but with all that being said, like I have had a ball down there, you know, I've had a great time, but I also, I, I, I try to show the women I date a great time. You know what I'm saying? Like most of the men, these women are dating, you know, if we're going to speak candidly about it. Don't have money. Right. If a guy's, you know, 25, 26, 27, he can't take her to a, you know, a 200 hay ice dinner or a 300 hay ice dinner. He can't take her to an island for the weekend, right? Like, so <clears throat> I'm not saying, like, just spend a bunch of money on these women. I'm just saying, like, you are a gringo that's there. You cannot also just take her to the same bar that Juan takes her to. You know what I'm saying? You need to do something a little different. You got to amp it up? Yeah, you just got to amp it up, bro. But it's going to be fun for everybody. It's going to be fun for you. It's going to be fun for her. You know, um, and I've just and I'll, I'll say also like um, so race obviously plays a factor in in uh, in dating culture, um, but that doesn't absolve you from not having game. Um, I've seen some white guys out there just crush it, you know. Uh, but I've seen some white guys out there who can't can't pull nobody. You know what I'm saying? They can't pull chicks because they don't they don't have any game. You got to have some game out there. Um, you know, I had a guy, this Brazilian guy, actually, a white guy, older guy. He was like a, a big time accountant for one of the grocery stores. Like he was like the main accountant for like a like a the district of grocery stores in the area. And he was like, Look, Steve, you'll be able to get any black woman you want, any mixed women you want, but you will not be able to get white women. Like the best white women. And I was like, For real? He was like, Yeah, for real. And he was he was right. That was the truth. You know, because race plays a role in dating. 
a big role in dating in Brazil. Uh, people date interracially more in Brazil, but like even with that, uh, the kind of same rules apply, right? Um, I would say that for a white guy or European white guy or a Canadian or whoever, um, or even an Asian guy, whoever, right? If you come to Brazil, you're going to be able to get a lot of women, but in certain women, you're not going to be able to get at all because your language barrier or the fact that you're foreign, or they've been burned by foreigners before, you know? So um, am I still cute in PG event? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just don't say anything that you, you know, want me to edit out later. Just don't make work. I, I, I won't. I won't. I won't. <laughs> um, no, I know you're saying there, there's like a, a chart that goes around and it's like, it's like Spanish level and uh, level of beauty of women that you can mm -hmm. attract. And it's like perfectly in sync. And it's like, as your language skills go up, mm -hmm. um, you know, you're going to be able to get better women. Cause it, like a, a lot of girls are, are, are definitely um, like, you'll get lots of like eights and nines and stuff like that. But someone that's like extremely, extremely sought after they're not going to really deal with the whole like Google Translate bullshit. No, hell no. Because they can get rich guys in their language, in their culture. They don't have to learn anything, you know. And I will say, bro, you are so right. The better my Portuguese has gotten, the quality of woman I've gotten has been way higher, bro. Like where I am now, three and a half years into speaking Portuguese and where I was day one, it's like night and day, bro. You know, because a woman can see you and be attracted to you, but you're stumbling over how to say good morning. She's not giving you the time of day. Yeah. You're stumbling over, like, how to order food at a restaurant. Like, get the hell out of here. She don't want to deal with that. Yeah. And, you know, for, for yeah, I mean, <coughs> and you, you, you jumped off the deep end, whereas, like, a lot of people would maybe start in Sao Paulo or something, and they, they could get mm -hmm. the, the half and half going. No. You Screw the half and half, man. Just go ahead. Look, man, you go to Brazil, get your girl who doesn't speak any English at all. Don't date women who speak English, okay? I you, have you'll had be that much, rule in the past. It'll be much better for it, okay? She started speaking English. She's also probably consuming American content, American internet trends. Yeah, it's right. just like, You don't want her to be exposed to that. Yeah, because, like, I dated a girl when I first got to Brazil, and she spoke amazing English bad idea okay <laughs> he was reading all these american articles about relationships <laughs> and feminism and yeah bro it was terrible bro yeah that's terrible. funny i think um i think i was very militant in the beginning and i was like do not speak english to me or i'm not <laughs> hanging out with you type shit and i've kind of like relaxed that back where i'm just kind of like you know what we'll just get the the spanglish going or the the portuguese mix and it's it's totally fine like i know you want to get some value out of this too yeah yeah man we we uh yeah bro, I, I wasn't like that i wasn't like that i um uh, i i i needed help i was like yo we're gonna like, I, I think i spoke english in brazil the entirety of my relationship with her those first two years and i was speaking in portuguese with other people but if i had spoke portuguese with her as well i would have learned portuguese so much faster you know mm -hmm. And uh, I'll probably have more fun too, but that's neither here nor there. But yeah, yeah man, I think for my guys, they're like, you know, you're, you're trying to get out. And it's not just about Brazil. Like, you know, any of these Spanish speaking countries or Brazil, like you need to have some rules. Like, yo, how many gringos have you dated? If it's more than one, like you don't need to talk to her anymore because she's a gringo I chaser. That. I agree with that. You know, that woman is a gringo chaser. Like, um, so you need to pay, you need to ask good questions. Like I had a friend of mine, he was in the airport. He met a girl at the, uh, she worked at the airport and she was like, yeah, I got a lot of friends that are gringos. And he still kept talking to her. I was like, bro, what are you doing? If she doesn't speak Portuguese, if she doesn't speak English, but all her friends are gringos and it's a lot of guys, are you not putting two and two together? She's smashing all the gringos. Where right. Where do you think she learned English? Yeah, bro. She's learning English from well, with my friend. I don't think he put. I don't. I don't think he put two and two together. That she's clearly just grabbing guys from. Uh, <laughs> she's grabbing guys at the airport. You know, my ex. She learned Portuguese. She learned English in school, 
And then she went and lived in England. Oh, like the girl wasn't even on the flight? She was just like chilling at the no, airport? No, bro. Like, she was just chilling at the at airport, the cab bro. Stand? Yeah, Damn, man. Not that's point. like that's like that's like kidnap level shit. Bro, <laughs> like, so he I talked to him. I was like, yo, put her on the phone. I want to talk to her. Cause he didn't speak Portuguese. And so I was like, hey, what's up? What are y'all doing tonight? Blah blah blah. Yeah. blah. She's like, I'm gonna do this, this, and this. Somehow he fumbled, he didn't smash her, but that's neither here nor there. But uh <coughs> he went out with it that night. <laughs> but I would say to guys, if she knows like anything more than like very basic English, just pass on it. You're gonna have a richer experience just dealing with somebody in the, that only speaks their, their language, and it's gonna help you so much more. You know. Uh, as, so as you women, said that Bahia was actually pretty traditional, but then, but it then it sounded you know more uh, not traditional. So I, I and I totally get what you're saying. I understand how there's sort of like a paradox. Yeah, um, mm-hmm. it's almost like it's almost like Latin women. It's almost like the traditional ones are more traditional, but the modern ones are or the whatever sexy ones yeah. are like more yeah. modern. You know what I mean? Oh, Whereas, like in the U.S., everyone's kind of like a little bit more in the middle. But I feel like in Latin America, it's a little bit more uh, on the extremes. Or like, yeah. how is how are people in but yeah, <laughs> still traditional? Like they're just they're just very like marriage minded and like they're relationship, relationship minded, minded, bro. They're relationship minded. You know what I'm saying? You might still get in the bed early with one, but it's still like we're doing this. Like, hey, I like you. I want to be with you. You know, if we do this more than a few times, like. Um, they, you know, in Portuguese they say uh, "ficando," or just "ficando." So it's like mm-hmm. we're staying together, like we're we're like we're talking essentially. Yeah. Um, and then you go into dating, right? So you might be messing around with this chick three or four or five months. In your head, that's not your girlfriend. In her head, you're you're her boyfriend already. You might not have said, "Hey, you my girlfriend now," but y'all are dating. Y'all are together, you know. <laughs> so. It's something to consider um, for the guys who can pull it off, you know, dating several women at a time down there. Might mess around and have two or three girlfriends, you know, <laughs> without knowing it if you keep it, if you keep them all in consistent rotation. So just something to keep in mind. And, and so uh, I, I'm guessing that uh, a lot of these girls that you meet, they'll, they'll end mm-hmm. up kind of bringing you to meet their family. And yeah. it's probably a very yeah. different experience. Like, and, and that's like the window into a world. It's crazy. And you've mm-hmm. probably had some pretty cool experiences where you've gone to kind of oh, like, man. you know, backyard, back, backyard barbecue type vibes. And Yo. there's some music playing and you meet the family and you, you end up talking to some random uncle for like time and all this yeah, type of stuff. Bro. Like, t- you, do you want to like break down a yeah, like, I got, or two uh, viv- bro, vivid I got experiences? I got a lot of them stories, bro. Like, I've uh my first my friend my ex she had like a whole bunch of those types of family around and like bro like I would go hang out with the guys man watch soccer games with like uncles and cousins and like brother in laws and stuff like that um just like like the first time I met her family I had been dating her for like six like bro I had known her for like six weeks and I met like everybody. Right, it was her thirtieth birthday party. Don't date over thirty, by the way. But uh, so it was our thirtieth birthday party. So I'm there and I meet everybody, and I'm just there like dancing samba, drinking with everybody, with like cousins and uncles and shit. And like, <clears throat> I wound up doing this. I started hanging with her family every weekend. You know, mm-hmm. I come by, I grill sometimes, bring a pack of beer by. Hey, Steve, come over here with us. We're doing this over here. Going to soccer games with guys, like, it's a great, like, I think one thing that I think that we don't do well in the Western culture, we don't do a good enough job of, hey, you met my mom and dad. Oh, well, hey, son, how are you doing? So tell me what you do for a living. And it's, like, super stiff, right? In Brazil, you meet somebody's family, and it's like, hey, we about to go hang out. We about to kick it. Come on. And so you have so much fun inside this family unit, right? And, like, like you'll go to birthday parties. You go to birthday parties for children in the family. And it's like, I think it's a much better experience overall. You know, it's a much lighter experience of getting to know somebody's family. That's supposed yeah, to how we do it in the States, man. Like, I, I literally time. know exactly what you're talking about. Like, yeah. for me, I, I still love just seeing, um, 
you know, people our age just partying with like 10 year old kids and like yeah. everyone's on the dance floor together yeah. and all that type of stuff. Mm-hmm. Still makes me laugh to this day. I love it, man. I love it. Like, and then like, it's crazy because you'd be like dancing with these 10 year olds and it'd be like a seven year old there too. And you'd be drinking with a seven year old at night, you know? And it's um like one of my first times that happened. And this wasn't a girl I was dating. This was one of my homeboys. Uh, well, he, he wasn't my homeboy. Then he was a guy I just met. Brazilian guy and his girlfriend, and this is back before I spoke Portuguese, and he was like, hey, you want to go to this bus stop? That's what I thought he said. He actually said, hey, let's go to this birthday party, All right? And so we're walking. I'm like, yo, we can call an Uber, bro. We don't have to go to the bus. He's like, no, man, just keep walking. It's like it's like almost nighttime. I'm in a favela. For like the, one of the first times I'm in a favela, and like I get there, and it's like week three of being in Brazil, bro. And it's like this, it's like this uh, barbecue and birthday party going on. I walk in, I walk down the driveway. They, this guy takes his shirt off his back, puts it on me, hands me a beer, and we start drinking immediately, bro. And that was my introduction wait, to him. Wait, why, why did you need a shirt? <laughs> so it was a, the shirt said, I'm in love with a prostitute, right? <laughs> and all the men had those shirts on, right? That was in the birthday party. And so okay. they put those shirts on me. <laughs> crazy oh, night bro yeah, yeah. I, I remember i woke up i mean I, I was like wasted making out with this 45 year old woman bro it was crazy man <laughs> crazy times man yeah man we we um yeah man i got a lot of them kind of stories i'm trying to keep a pg for y'all so yeah, i'm trying to i feel you I'll, I'll ask you a question so um and I, I feel like i almost know the answer but i really want i really um, want to hear your answer yeah. Do people care about your internet personality? Do people know you even have Twitter? Have people oh, seen your YouTube videos? Do people nothing. care how you make money at all? Bro, these my Brazilian friends don't give a damn, bro. Okay? They don't care about anything I do for a living. Like, literally, like, they know that I'm an insurance adjuster because I explained it. They watch all my videos. They like it. They'll say, hey, Steven, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't understand it, but... They're really supportive, you know, um, <clears throat> but like they don't. Brazilians aren't big on Twitter and they're not taking the time to translate my tweet. So they never none of my Brazilian friends see, have seen my Twitter, bro. You know, they uh, and they and they're like on Instagram. I only speak in English on Instagram and I rarely talk about Brazil on Instagram. So like they don't even interact with me, bro, on Instagram. It's crazy. Do you use a, a personal Instagram as well, or just every, if yeah. when you pe- meet people on the street, you just give them the the one with yeah. the 14k followers? Yeah, bro, uh, and I do it just like that. And like they're like, "Wow, you got so many followers!" I'm like, "Yeah," but don't worry, I'm never going to talk in Portuguese there, so <laughs> you don't have to follow me if you don't want to, you know. Um, but yeah, man, like 14,000 followers in Brazil, like you know, bro, it's Instagram, and like people think that's cool. Um, to me, uh, that's a business metric for me. That's how I build out a base of people that want to purchase my stuff. You know what I'm saying? So I don't think about it the same way. But, yeah. bro, they don't care about my job. They don't care about any of the things I do on social media at all. They, they care yeah, how I like respond. They don't, they don't think of you as an influencer. They don't think of, no. They just think of you as like a normal American guy. Mm-hmm. Bro, like, <laughs> this shit is hilarious, man. Like, this is how little money my, my friends think I make. They were like, so, Steven, like, you're like Brazilian middle class. I was like, what the fuck? Like, you think I'm Brazilian middle class? Okay, cool, perfect. I'm I'm doing this right, you know? So, like, I'm not flashy at all, bro, in Brazil, by the way. Being flashy in Brazil is a great way to get robbed. It's a great way to put your life at risk. It's a great way to get hurt. A uh, great way to get set up by men and women, you know? Um, I'm really low-key down there. I make it a point that my friends dress better than me. Not that I'm, some, I'm dressed like a bum, but I really – tone it down down there you know mm-hmm. um i go to i go to nice places i do nice things I have, a, I have a great apartment but i really just keep it low key down there i want to blend in the like, crowd do you have like an ocean view apartment views of the sunset like yeah shit. i do i do yeah yeah bro my place is huge bro by the way i i, I can send it I'll, I'll send it to you when we get off the call but yeah bro, my place is insane seriously like, and uh people people like hearing about prices like how much do you pay per month for your ocean view apartment in Salvador. So my apartment is 
about 2,500 square feet. And it has four bedrooms. Like yeah, bro. It's four bedrooms. Every bedroom has an ocean view. And it's all marble throughout, marble and hardwood floors throughout. Um, I got a huge balcony, a huge kitchen. My kitchen is the size of like a big bedroom. Um, Sixteen hundred dollars US. And it, do you feel like it's almost too nice? Like when you bring people over, it changes the bro, dynamic. I can't bring people over, bro. It's too nice. It's too nice, bro. My apartment was a thousand dollars a month. Was too nice. You know. What, what are you doing with four bedrooms, bro? Who's who's chilling? Well, well, I got the four bedrooms because I wanted my family to start coming to see me. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to have some of my American friends start to come and stay with me for like a month at a time. Also, I need an office. So one of the bedrooms, out of the four bedrooms, one of the bedrooms is an office. Uh, and then another one is a movie room. So it's essentially a two bedroom apartment as far as where people are going to be sleeping at, you know. But I, I needed space, bro. Like I've been working from home in a pan- through the pandemic. And I was working in a, a one bedroom place and it was just too small, bro. So I was like, I'm getting a shit ton of space and I'm going to start inviting people over here. But I, I found that uh, before I had the apartment, I had two par- apartments ago. I had a big apartment <clears throat> and it changed the dynamic for some of my Brazilian friends. And I was like, OK, I can't y'all can't come over no more. You know what I'm saying? How, because how it changed the dynamic. Well, like, bro, like. You know, I've been to their home in the favela like ten times, and then you come, you come to my house for the first time. Sitting on a plastic chair, you know. Yeah, I'm sitting on you know a little yellow plastic chair, drinking a you know javasa or whatever, and like listening to you know music out of the Bluetooth speaker. And you come to my house, and it's like I've never even seen marble floors in a home before, you know. <laughs> um, or you you see a home that's like a home out of a movie or like a television show. And that's where your friend lives at. You never knew this. You know what I'm saying? So, like, I found that um, I had to be a lot more reserved in that in that regard. Like, I can't just be like, yo, bro, come on. Everybody come over. No. Don't do that. Do not do that. You know, you got to. <clears throat> and it's something to keep in mind as a, being a nomad or being a traveler or whatever. Like, you got to keep in mind ways that you can keep the respect in a relationship and keep the friendship going because you don't know how hard they struggle just to have what they have. And then <clears throat> they see you kind of just hanging out all the time and you're making like, you live in a place that's like their dream home or like, it's like you live in an area that they won't even dream about because that's so far out of their reach. You know, does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it was always a weird experience where uh, girls want to, you know, make an effort and, um, you know, maybe buy me some beers or whatever and uh, or buy the next round. And I make like 30 times the amount they make, you know? Yeah, yeah, bro. Like, I'll be like, bro, um, what the fuck, man? Like, yeah, like, and I was talking, about, I was talking to my mom about that, you know, like, you'll make, bro. There's been times I've been in a room with like 15 people and I'm like, I make one of all y'all combined per month. And that's not even hard because if everyone's making 300 bucks and you're making yeah. 10K a month, which is pretty normal, like 10K a month. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, if, if you had 10 people making 300 bucks, that's that's only 3K. You know what I'm saying? You had 30 yeah, people bro. making, you had 30 people making 300 bucks. That That's, that's still 9K. It's, yeah. It's like we're not even, yeah. And so like. But but this is what I had this is what I had to do, bro. I stopped offering to pay for things, and I just started splitting things with everybody. I'll pay my portion. You know what I'm saying? Like if, like as five guys go for beer, and we need to split the beer up. I might have a fifty on me, right? And I'll put a fifty down. All right, I put it. That might be an extra twelve hay ice on on the beer. I'll do stuff like that. It just be a little bit more. I don't I don't I make I allow everybody to still be a man. You know what I'm saying? Right. These yeah, guys work great. hard and they want to, you know what I'm saying? They want to, they want to pay their way too. And so like, I found that, no, don't pay for everybody. Don't be the guy who pays for everybody. Just, you know, yo, I'll, I'll, I'll get a pack of beer. Okay. I'll go, I'll get, I'll get some regular beef for the barbecue, whatever. You just keep it simple, man. And if you do that, you're usually going to be fine. But when you start like being a big dog, 
no, nah, man. Then, it, heaven forbid, they see your house, bro. Like, <sighs> back to the women for one second. Like, do it. You know, I, I was at a point where I was seeing several women at a time, and like, my place was pretty cool. You know what I'm saying? I had a loft apartment, and um, it was like totally remodeled and everything. It was really, really nice looking place. And bro, they will all take pictures in my house, bro. All of them. <laughs> I've had that happen. I've had girls say, uh, "Can I bring a photographer tomorrow for a photo shoot?" And I was like, right. "I was like, all right, can I film it too?" <laughs> right, bro. They'll come to your house and take pictures in your house and post it, and you have like several women with the same background on Instagram. Right, like, I know that spot. <laughs> like, oh, come on, man! Like, stop. Yeah, it's crazy, man. It's really crazy, you know. So it's it's um, yeah, man. I, I've I've had a uh, yeah, yeah. You you got to kind of you you deal with some things that you wouldn't necessarily deal with in the states. I'll put it like that, or in Canada, or wherever you wherever you are in the West, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. But you got to pay attention. It, you got to. Yeah. You say we're not trying to say we're ballers. It's just kind of it's just kind of how it is. I don't know. Yeah, that's how it is, bro. Like, you're not going to stay in the hood, dog. Like, you're probably going to stay somewhere nice. And I remember I was dating my, my – I'm just talking about my ex because that's who I dated my first few years in Brazil. And, bro, she was like, why are you staying in this place? It's so expensive. You don't have to stay here. You can stay somewhere cheaper. And so I was like, why in the hell would I stay somewhere cheaper? You know, like – it doesn't give me the quality I want, but what I what I realized was about Brazilians is Brazilians like um, they like price. They pay they they buy based on price. So if it's cheaper in their mind, it's better. But in the Western world, we're like, no, if it's more expensive, it's better. You know, so it's just uh, a mindset shift. You know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so so tell me this. I mean. Um... Have you ever had one of your your boys like from like high school or like mm-hmm. one of your 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 true true boys like join mm-hmm. you for this adventure? No, never, not one. What's up with that? I don't know, bro. I told him I said I told him I was because I saw some of them recently, and I was like, bro, I'm not inviting you anymore, bro. Like it's been three and a half years. I asked you to come several times. You said you were coming. I prepared for you to come, and you didn't come. Like so. Yeah, man, you come if you want to, but whatever. Yeah, you know, I, 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 you know uh, Stakes is high on Twitter, right? Yeah, that's my dog, man. Have you guys met up? I, I was supposed to meet up with him when he was in Brazil last year. I'll probably, I'll probably, if he's still down when I go back, I'll go see him. But I was, yeah, he's, I was supposed he, to. Yeah, he, he gave me a message to you. He said, bro, reach down to his, uh, his part of the, the world. Yeah, man, I'm a fan. I'm a fan of him. But, but what about him, though? Uh, well, it's the same kind of thing that I think, um, stakes, uh, stakes and I talked about, I actually had a, a, a podcast with him. It's not out yet, but we did one, uh, like yeah. a week or two ago, uh, yeah. something that I go through as well, something that you go through as well, mm-hmm. where it's like, we can only really lead by example. And we, we right. try to show people like what's to us seems like obviously a, a better life or at least, right. or at least friggin' visit like for a minute, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? And it's um, it can be frustrating when people are kind of like stuck in their ways. Yeah, man. Like, and, and they'll like they'll go to Mexico or something like that. That's cool. But I'm not in Mexico. They go to Colombia. I'm like, bro, you're you're right here. You're on the right continent. Just come down the street. Mm-hmm. You know. And um, but what I found is is that like language barriers, <clears throat> language barriers, flight prices <clears throat> determine a lot. You know. They'll spend three hundred dollars to go to to go to to go to Colombia from Miami, but they won't spend that eight hundred dollars to go to Brazil. You know what I mean? But he, or all, even just kind of showing someone the the digital nomad lifestyle and showing oh, guys yeah. like what it like what do you what are you doing in Alabama? Like you can travel the world, you know? Yeah, bro. Like that's you know, man. I had a friend of mine. And uh, I don't even talk to him that much anymore, you know. And I was like, bro, like, you you got some, you got a lump sum of money saved. Come down here with me, man. Just spend six months here in Brazil with me, bro. You can stay at my house. You don't got to pay rent. Just hang out, bro. Just kind of get a reset on life, you know. And I'm coming, Steve. I'm coming, man. Bro, I'm coming. I'm coming. 
They never came, man. And like one thing I would say to the guy, the digital nomad, bro, this is a lonely journey. You're going to do this shit on your own. Mm -hmm. Nobody's coming with you, dog. Nobody. I don't care if they say they're coming or not. If they say, oh, bro, I promise you, man, we're going to do this together. You're still on a journey solo, bro, because at any given time, yeah, man, my girlfriend, man, she wants me to come back to the States, man. I'm coming back. Like, <laughs> and, it, you know, and that's it. And you're alone. So it's like, you got to keep that in mind. Oh, I, I, check your DM, by the way. I just sent you my apartment. All right. I already know it's going to be insane. Just check it out. I want, oh, my God. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Man's not playing. This yeah, is bro. not an Airbnb. This is not an Airbnb, bro. I just, I got it, and I had to go to the States the next day, so I still haven't decorated it yet. I'll still get some more furniture. But, yeah. I don't know who else in Salvador could be living here except the governor yeah bro so like <laughs> funny story so this like rapper guy was living there before me and he's like but he's like famous you know what i'm saying like mm -hmm. like imagine like a two chains version like a brazilian two chains like it was a like a famous yeah. guy like a, a funkero yeah like it was a big time rapper that was staying there and he was like i went there to look at the house and look at the apartment while he was still living there and he was looking at me like who the fuck is this guy they can get this place. And he's just some regular dude, you know? But, um, yeah, man, you know, it's the mindset, man. The mindset of the digital nomad, I think that it's easy to say it's what you want to do until it's time to go do it. And that's when it gets hard. And that's when you got to really double down on your resolve and say, like, yo, look, if even if it gets hard for a bit, I'm still going to do this shit. Even if, even if my business fucks up for a bit and I don't have so much money, I'm still going to figure it out. I'm not going back home. You know, you got to put in your mind, I'm not going back until I get what I want out of this experience. You know, um, what do you think about that? Um, well, yeah, there, there's this concept called the hero's journey. Um, mm -hmm. Have you have you seen that? There's like a diagram too. you could Google it right now, the hero's journey and put, pull see. it up on Google images. And it's sort of like. I haven't looked at it in a while, so I might not do it justice, but it's almost like you go, it's almost like you go, it's almost like you go into the matrix, you have your hero's journey, and then you come back around. I'm not doing it justice. I gotta look it up. Hold on, bro. I'm but looking at it. I'm, I'm pulling it up. Digital I'm nomads go through what's kind of like, it's the, they go through the, the hero's journey. I, I have it in front of me. So basically, okay. you have a, a call to adventure, and you know wow. that there's something out there. You have this purpose that's out there for you. And you're in this world of the known and you know that you need to step into the unknown and along the way into the path into the unknown, you're going to meet a couple archetypes along the way. There's the helper, there's the mentor, mm -hmm. there's mm -hmm. challenges and temptations. Um, so now you're in the unknown and you're kind of getting helped. You're in the unknown. Then there's going to be the abyss where you mm -hmm. are, you're, you reach a point of revel revelation there's a moment of rebirth and you've basically undergone a transformation. And then after yeah. that, at least according to this one, while still in the unknown, you've been transformed. There's a period of atonement and mm -hmm. atonement, uh, freestyling here, but atonement would be sort of like coming to terms with the known and who you, who you used to be. Um, before you're allowed to leave the hero's journey and leave the unknown back into the known. And then the next step is the return. And it's the yeah. gift of your return back into the known. And that's uh, that's one uh, version of the hero's journey. Bro, I feel all, I, I experience all those. I experience every single, every single stage I've experienced on this journey. You know? And, um, I think I was going through atonement last year. Maybe even yeah. this summer. Yeah. Yeah. This, I think this summer is, maybe I probably went and did it again. I know I had my temptation, my <laughs> temptations. I had my death and rebirth. And um, yeah, just like, yo, I, yeah, you're right. Kind of to, kind of tie it back to the end of the conversation. Like, yo, when I got back to Alabama, I was like, yo, this is not me at all anymore. I am nothing like this at all anymore. I'm completely different. And I was kind of having some of those ideas, those thought processes like, yo, man, like I'm, 
I don't have the same friends anymore. My new friends, they do these types of things. They, 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 they're much more spontaneous than my old friend group, you know? And, um, can you hear me Vance? I hear you. I hear you. Okay, cool. Just making sure I, I didn't know if my, my, my internet had messed up, but, uh, yeah, it's like, you look back and it's like, yo, my whole life is completely different. I can't go back. I've dug too deep now. I can't go back to where I used to be at. You know, it's a, it's a special experience. And I, I encourage all y'all to try it, man. Like, if you can do it, if you got the courage to go through it, it's gonna you're going to become a much better person on the back end. Mm-hmm. You know, you're going to learn so much more, become so much more intelligent. You know, it's a, it's worth, it's a worthwhile journey, the hero's journey. I never yeah, heard it put it, like that. And, and no one's going to go on the hero's journey with you. You got to do it alone. Nope. <laughs> no, you know, it's, it's a one, you know, but it's like, I feel like that's what life is about, man. Like life ain't just about like, you know, graduate, make X amount of dollars, get married, some girl, and then, you know, have some kids and you do that till you die. Yeah. Where's the hero's I, journey? Yeah. Where is the hero's journey, man? Like, yo, like we could, there's so much more we can do there. You know, it's so much more, man. It's like, you know, I hope I hope that I can illustrate to y'all like dog, I'm from Tuscaloosa, Alabama. I'm from a small town. I didn't leave. Now, granted, I did some travel, but I didn't leave my home, my state of Alabama until I was 26 years old. I didn't leave the United States until I was 30. I celebrated my 30th birthday in Canada, you know, as far as leaving to live outside of the country. So I didn't start until 30. I didn't start picking up my second language until I was almost 31, you know. So don't think that you got to be 19 to do this. You know what I mean? Like you can start later. You know, you don't have to do this whole like, well, I'm in my 30s now, bro. I got to climb the corporate ladder. Like, no, you don't. You don't have to do it that way. There's another way to make money. There's another way to apply apply yourself. You can have success in a different way. Like, uh, and you can still have some physical things in this world. Like, you know, you you just saw my place. Y'all, I'm not going to put it online for y'all to see, anybody to see because I don't want anybody to see it unless I send it to you or you come to my house. But Vance, what you, what you think about the place? You think it's 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 like I said, man, it was dope. <coughs> so I have a question for you. You, you said Yo. that you did resonate with the revelation and the rebirth, kind of yeah. like the depth, the abyss before mm-hmm. that led to the transformation. What what was yeah. that re- uh, rebirth moment for you? Man, it was August 2019. Well, no, no, I'm sorry. It went August 2019. It was when I came to, uh, when I met my real group of friends in Brazil, my real group of uh, other digital nomads and expats. That would have been November 2020. Mm-hmm. And then just really getting tight with them and building that relationship up over the next almost two years now. Like, those there's probably like six months into that i was like yo these people are so much better and i clicked with them so much better than i did with other people in my life in the past like they just get it they get my outlook on life i'm not the weird guy anymore you know i'm not the guy that got his head in the cloud anymore i'm just like a regular guy in this group of people now and so that was kind of my rebirth like when i was like i look up one day and i was like yo these are my friends like these people are, they, these people are crazy successful, you know, speak multiple languages. They've been all over the world. They lived all over the world, impacted a lot of people. And I'm just like, damn, this is, these are my, these are my peers now. You know what I'm saying? Like that was my rebirth moment, man. Um, yeah, it just, it just blew my mind away. So I was like, wow, is this what I've done to myself? You know, is this how, you know, is this, are these the type of people I'm, I'm actually like the most? Uh, because in my head, I'm still some, I'm a young guy from, from the country. You know what I'm saying? I'm from Tuscaloosa. That was my inner thoughts. I'm, I still am from there, but like, that was my main perspective of myself, you know? And I hadn't really fully grasped the idea that I was bilingual and I was living in another country and I was, you know, doing things that I was doing. Yeah, definitely. Did the the girlfriend you had of two years or, or yeah. any of the subsequent girls, did you have you brought them back to Alabama? I have not brought a single Brazilian back to the States. What yeah. what's your thought process on that? That ain't my goal. <laughs> I'm not trying to take them out of Brazil. I'm trying to stay in Brazil. Yeah. You know, I don't really you know, 
to me, I don't see a reason to leave. I, I want to be in Brazil for a while. You know, like I want to live there for a while. I don't plan on coming back to the States. So I don't want to take somebody out of Brazil to the States. Even just for like two weeks to see your mom. Even and- for that. Even for that. You know, like, yeah, you can meet my, I can meet your mom and dad here. That's cool. But like, you know, I don't, nah, nah, nah. I don't, I don't see the point, you know, like, unless we were having children together, I don't see why you should come to the States. So let me ask you about children. I'm just doing mental math. You're, you're probably like 34 ish now. Yep. I'm 34. Yeah. Um, how do you, how do you think about kids now? I want kids. Um, you know, I want to be in a, a serious relationship. I want to get married and all that. You know, um, if I had children in Brazil, I would probably live in Brazil for a time. And then I would want them to come to the States so they can get their education in the United States. For sure. United States or Europe. You know, Canada, even Canada has a great education system too. Um, but I wouldn't want to have my children educated in Brazil unless they went straight private Pan-American schools, you know, speaking only English, that type of deal. Um, let me push back on that. Like, why, why would that be? Because don't you feel like people in Brazil, you know, they have much more street smarts and all that type of stuff. Mm-hmm. Obviously, there is an aspect of, of a, you know, the American education system that's really, really good. Like, yeah. obviously, most Brazilian people don't even know what a IPO is or what the, what right, the right, difference right. between a stock and a bond is. You know what I mean? But, yeah. But at the same time, I, I, I'm fearful of raising kids in Canada, the United States, because I just fear that they're going to grow up too spoiled and with too many like fucked up new wave ideas. Now, and you got a point there. I agree because we're talking about our Canada from 20 years ago or, you know, our you know United States from you know 25 years ago when I was growing up in you know the school system. Um, yeah, man, you know. I think that one of the drawbacks, bro, for me in Brazil, especially living there for as long as I live there now, like really having to look at the education system, I'm like y'all do not take education serious. Some do, most don't, mm-hmm. you know? And then on top of that, depending on where you are in Brazil, they teach you some real deal leftist shit too, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. So is you really got to be vigilant about what it is you want your children to learn. And that's, and that's just any, anywhere in the world, right? But but um, I think that you really got to – for me, it's like this, man. Like, I have to give my children an advantage some kind of way, all right, other than just be, me being their dad. Like, mm-hmm. all right, you're Brazilian because you're born here in Brazil, but your father's American. I got to at least get you extremely fluent. Like, you got to be very good in English, you know, and math. That's the minimum. And I think the best way to do that is either send them to school in Europe for a bit or send them to school in the States. One or other. For a yeah. period of time. You know, you might do, you know, till fifth grade in Brazil. And then you go to the States for the rest of the time or Europe, you know, for the rest of the time or Canada or whatever. But I, I got to have a strong, strong English background. Yeah. And mm-hmm. emphasis on education. Yeah, yeah, exactly, man, because Brazil's a place where you can kind of just like, oh, fuck it, we don't really need to do, do much. I just need to, you know, pay my rent and pay for my car. No, I don't got to do anything else. You know, it, it can be a very easy it, – it, it can be a place where you can kind of just be like, oh, I don't need – I just don't need – I don't need that much, so you don't do so much. You know what I mean? So I, was, I still want to be able to push those values into my, my children, of, you know, hard work, education – and looking for opportunity to, to, to build businesses or grow the family in, in the family's influence. You know? Agreed. Agreed, man. Dude, this has been one of the best podcasts I've done for real. <laughs> I appreciate it, bro. I appreciate it, man. I enjoyed it, man. I'm glad I got to talk about Brazil. I like talking about it, bro. It's just that I think that sometimes when you start talking about it, it brings out the weirdos. You know, it'll bring out weirdos. So I stopped talking about it for a while. I'm like, all right, I ain't talking about Brazil no more because y'all. Oh, y'all you mean like on the internet? Oh uh, yeah, I mean on the internet. Yeah, I mean on the uh, internet. Yeah, 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 man. But this is this is a good one, man. I'm glad we got to do this one, bro. Finally, 
You know, and I've always been a fan of your account too, by the way. Thank you. Thank you, man. Yeah, this is uh this was a really, really good podcast. I haven't had anyone just like really break down such a good first hand experience in a while. Mm hmm Yeah, man. I'm I'm I used to document it more, but I'm just glad I can talk about it. And, and bro, I left a lot out. I left a lot out, y'all, just so you know, it's a lot more to it than this. But uh you got to see it in person. <laughs> you gotta yeah. meet me and yeah, I can show you in person. I, yeah. I think I'm gonna do it. I think I'm gonna have to put Salvador on the list, man, because I know I know you're posted up. I know you're there. Bro, you hey, you got somewhere to stay. You know, it's a lot of Canadians down in Salvador too, bro. Yeah, man. This was a really, really good episode. Um I'm I'm slightly upset that the audio was like less than perfect. I really hope people made it to the end because damn oh, the second half was so damn good. Yeah, my bad. I was driving, man. Like it is what yeah, it is. Bro. Is what it is. I guess that means uh know. we'll do a around two and we'll, we'll chop it up some more perfect perfect man perfect vance i appreciate you man dude thank you so much for your time this has been steven story um his twitter handle is tell the people how to spell it s-t-e-p-h-e-n-s-t-o-r-e-y you can you can hit me up on there you got any questions man feel free to uh to 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 start a conversation with me i'm down to talk Excellent. And it's been another episode of the My Latin Life podcast. Steven, man, thank you so much. You're welcome, bro.